Welcome or welcome back to Lift You Up Inspiring Health Stories. I'm your host, Tamika Bickham. I am the founder and chief storyteller of TB Media Group, but for the purpose of this podcast, I am your health and happiness matchmaker. Now, before I introduce you to today's guest, you know what I'm going to ask you to do. If you haven't done it already, hit subscribe on YouTube, turn on those notifications, and also connect with me on LinkedIn. I'd love to stay connected with you. Now today, hey, we're back supporting nonprofits, which is something that I love to do. And you are going to meet Somi Ali, who runs the nonprofit No More Tears USA. She's telling us her story of getting away from domestic violence and now how she's helping other survivors. Our physical, mental, and emotional health is not just a want, it is a need for happy lives and prosperous businesses. Lift You Up is the podcast where we share inspiring health stories from business owners who are fulfilling their purpose to live their healthiest lives and helping you do the same. From former TV reporter to marketing entrepreneur and content creator, I care about sharing stories that matter and stories that connect us. I'm your host, Tamika Bickham, your health and wellness matchmaker. Well, I'm so excited today to be joined by and meet for the first time Somi Ali, who is the founder and president of No More Tears USA and stunning. (laughs) Thank you. you, And thank you for having me on. I'm so excited. No, thank you for being here because, you know, just the little that I know about your story so far is truly inspiring and important, important one to share. So I'm excited to dive into that and share more about what you're doing and how you're you're helping others. So thanks for being here and doing that. Thank you. So Somi, let's start off with your story. Tell me, you know, we'll start with present day, kind of what you do today with No More Tears USA. So No More Tears every day is very different. The primary, I mean, primarily it was created to help victims of domestic violence in 2007. I grew up in a home of domestic violence in Pakistan and um, myself being a victim of child sexual abuse from the age of five to nine uh, and then rape at the age of 14, all of this led to the birth of No More Tears. And um, every day is very unpredictable and very different at No More Tears because We provide services to the LGBTQ community, uh, victims of human trafficking, victims of domestic violence, children that are sexually and physically abused. In addition to that, we also rescue pets that are in domestic violence households and because pets get get abused as well. So what makes unique, uh, No More Tears unique is that we have no waiting list. We provide immediate assistance. We do not have a shelter. We have other means of of safe housing and we give them a safe house for 10 days, the first 10 days. Then the next day I file a restraining order um, and then we provide them with their own homes as in apartments. We pay the first, last security. And then with our donors help and our board of directors help, people go in and deliver furniture and decorate their apartments for them. It's very important to make them financially independent. The number one reason, there's several reasons, but you know, many a time victims don't leave, they can't leave because they don't have any money. And um, also in many instances, we work with a lot of women brought here from different countries that are undocumented and the abusers, uh, it could be men or, or women because men get abused too. Little boys get sexually abused too. They don't file their paperwork intentionally that they have repeatedly said, I've talked to abusers and they're like, well, that's one way of keeping them on a leash because they threaten them of being undocumented and being deported. And now remember these women have given birth to children in the US. So the, the husband or boyfriend would say, well, if, if I deport you, get you deported, or, or if you call the cops and you go, let's say, to Honduras, you're going to lose your, your son and daughter because they were born in America. So there's so many facets as to why victims don't leave. And, um, you know, it's been, it's been a challenge running this organization for 14 years because there's such a stigma attached to domestic violence. And, and fundraising for this mission has been really, really difficult. But nonetheless, I'm proud to say that since our inception, we've rescued 30,000 men, women, and children. 
Wow. 30,000. Yes. Well, I mean, that's kudos to you and congratulations for for um, accomplishing that and doing this over 14 years. So you mentioned that you are working with um, survivors of uh, human trafficking, domestic violence. Um, is there a certain percentage that kind of falls into a category more than the other? Do you feel like most of those that you help are victims or survivors of human trafficking or is it kind of? I'll tell you that since March, when last year, when COVID was at its peak, we've had more domestic violence victims than human trafficking victims. Um, but but it's a balance. I would say I would say it's 60, 40, 60 percent are domestic violence, 40 percent are human trafficking uh, victims. And then, of course, we call them victims once they're a victim of a crime. Once they're under our care, we transform them into, transform them into uh, survivors. And our, we get our referrals from all the local police departments, hospitals, emergency rooms, from high schools. Um, I get calls from doctors that they they sense something is going wrong. Uh, there's domestic violence. Um, and we work with the Department of Homeland Security. We also work with the National Human Trafficking Hotline. So we get referrals from all over the United States. Um, so yeah, there's no shortage of victims, unfortunately, but since COVID, it's been more domestic violence. I mean, we have housed since March, which COVID was at its peak, uh, to now 192 victims in our safe space and then house them into apartments. We rely prim primarily on private donors. So, you know, we met some very, very good people, good service providers, like the, my OBGYN is the gynecologist for the survivors. Um, you know, my dentist is the dentist for the survivors. So, so the OBGYN and the dentist, they don't take a, a dollar. Dr. Robert Bass is our gyneco gynecologist. And he, you know, he sees all the survivors for free for the past five years. Um, our do dentist, Dr. Kathy Ferguson, we have Tommy who's in um, South Beach. They don't take any money. 100% uh, of No More Tears' money goes to victim services programs. Now, what, what does that mean? That means that from um, groceries. When you apply for food stamps, they don't come right away. What are you supposed to do in the interim? So groceries and housing and attorney costs. Now, I, I in 2007, when I started No More Tears, when we approved, we were approved with our 501c3 status, I found private immigration and family law attorneys. And I told them that, look, I'll give you a, give us a discounted rate, but prioritize my men and women and children. Um, you know, don't put their file in, in the in the bottom of the shelf because these this in, this cause is very important for me. It's a very family oriented nonprofit. Um, you know, we celebrate birthdays of children who never celebrated their birthdays. The the abusers just don't do things for them. We have a, a young lady who's pregnant now. She's due in June. This is going to be my fifth delivery um, in 14 years. The first one I actually fainted. Uh, but it, it was very rewarding because the victim named her daughter Somi, which was probably the best compliment I could ever receive for doing this work. So my question is, because I've talked with and been involved with other nonprofit organizations who are supporting and, and helping um, human trafficking survivors. Um, and I think what I hear a lot is the challenge when it comes to housing um, and that they're only able to serve so many or help so many. How are you able to help so many individuals um, in a short space of time? So we're partners with hotels. And, and the reason I don't, I don't want, I don't like to disclose that because I don't want abusers going out after, but, but your question warrants an honest answer. Uh, I deem it to be a safe space, but we work with extended stay La Quinta and residents in, and that's primarily why we were able to provide them those 10 nights. And in those 10 nights, we work with realtors who immediately find them a one bedroom or a two bedroom. Again, we get a discount because we work with property management companies that know who we are. We give them tax donation receipts. So they give us a good rental, a good apartment for a decent amount of rent. Um, but yeah, the, the reason we were able to house them is because we work with hotels. Wow. And we've been working with hotels since our inception. 
I did not want a shelter because I volunteered at shelters and not to undermine shelters. Shelters do wonderful work, but the problem with shelters is that when they're at full capacity, where are the survivors supposed to go? Or if you have a shelter that allows you to stay for 30 to 60 days, what are you gonna do after those 60 days? And then your time is up, you have to go. So shelters are great, but what makes us unique and what I am proud of and our, our board members is, are proud of is that we give them the tools to, to uh, fish, we teach them to fish, we give them the tools to become financially independent. Look, every victim is not gonna get her PhD. The first victim that we did rescue who was from Jordan, her only dream was to go to school. And she graduated with her PhD in pharmacy in 2011 through our program, which was again, one of the happiest days of my life. Uh, because she graduated from, from Nova where I went. And um, her story was awful. She was beaten for 10 years. She used to hide in the bathroom, teach herself how to speak English from an Arabic to English dictionary. And her husband just would not let her pursue an education. And when she, she found our information in a grocery store, in an Arabic, uh, Arab ethnic grocery store. And, you know, when we went to help her, she had chunks of hair missing from her scalp. She was black and blue. And um, so it was unbelievable for her to, be, to go through this program, go to Nova, obtain her degree. And for me to attend her graduation was, it, it's, it, it's a high like no, no other. It was beautiful. So a lot of men, what they're doing is they, they're dating white girls or, or American girls, but then when they want to get married, they want to bring a girl from their home country because they want, they want someone who's a virgin. And then two, they want someone who's going to be subservient and submissive and, and you know, obedient and take care of their housework and clean and cook and clean and, and produce children. That's what the husband, the, the, the woman who got her PhD, that's what the husband kept telling her. I brought you from Jordan because I wanted someone who's going to be a housewife, who's going to be a mother, and who's going to be, uh, you know, taking care of me and the house. So it was all about him. It's all about the abusers. I don't know if you, if you ever get a chance, I'm reading this, uh, I'm actually listening to this audiobook called Pray by Ayan Hirsi Ali, who's a Somalian activist. And, and she talks about how many women get abused that are brought here from different countries. And um, honor killings and child marriages are not exclusive to these specific countries. It happens here all the time. That's really good to, good to know. Um, who, I guess my question is, who is, when you say they're bringing them here, who's bringing them here and why? So all the men. The men that are working here, that are living in the United States, that are American here. men. No, there, there. It could be Hispanic men. I've seen a lot of sixty percent of the victims that we have worked with uh, last year were Hispanic that were abused because in the Hispanic culture, there's the machismo mentality. Right. You right. know, in, in in the Pakistani Indian culture, it's a very patriarchal system. So. Right. It's a very male dominated society and I'm living proof, witness living proof of it because I grew up in a home where, I, you know, I saw my mother being abused and also I was taught that a girl's job it has, uh, there's a significant, you know, specific things that a girl should do. She should get married at a certain age. She should get have children at a certain age societal norms and conformities to societal norms is what we are taught in certain cultures. Right. And even in the fifties in the United States, the woman would be the housewife. The woman would stay home and the husband would be the breadwinner. So it wasn't much different here either. Now, fortunately, uh, progress, there's been vast progress. It's, uh, you know, there's been great progression. There are women who are CEOs now. There are women who are making more money than their than their husbands or their boyfriends. So things are getting better. Um, you know, I like to be optimistic, but the crimes against women and children are have not, not gone down. In fact, throughout COVID, COVID it, they have worsened. It's, it, it's amazing what I've seen since March. It's unfathomable. Why do you think that is? 
people are getting laid off, people are getting, you know, furloughed, people are, 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 are drinking, they're abusing drugs. All of a sudden, you just don't become an abuser. You, you're, it has to be innately in you. There's already a problem with a man who's raising a hand on a woman or a child. And there's already a problem with a woman who's doing that to a man because we have male victims as well. And these male victims were brought up with an upbringing that you never raise your hand on a woman or a child. So we have male survivors that took the abuse. And so, you know, it's in addition to COVID and in addition to being cooped up, in addition to getting laid off, what happens is that they start taking out their anger on whoever's around. Going back to your story, because you mentioned how, um, you know, these were some of the cultural norms as far as, you know, growing up in, in Pakistan and your mother being beaten and seeing that, what changed for you in your mind? Like, how were you, what triggered you to want to leave that situation or knowing that that was wrong if you were brought up believing that's how things should be? So it, it so from the age of 16 to 24 I was in Bollywood. I was a Bollywood actor and I was I was seeing a very very huge star who was the equivalent of Brad Pitt of India. And I actually went to India at the age of 16 to find him and marry him. It sounds ludicrous at this point, but I had a crush. The sim- similarly Katie uh, what's her name? Katie Holmes had a crush on Tom Cruise. Um, I was one of those rare individuals who actually went to India to find him and marry him and, uh, and ended up dating him. But the relationship was very abusive and it was verbally abusive. It was physically abusive. But I had grown up thinking that at 16, that mom was abused too. My mom was abused too. And, and you know, there was literally a point where he would tell me that, hey, why don't I go hit the neighbors, the, the neighbor? I hate you because I love you and I care and I and I hate you and only because you know I want you to do this I want you to do what's right and I was such a child that I thought that he's right because that's what I grew up in that's from the age of four you know I watched my mother being abused so I thought this was a cultural norm and then also Domestic violence victims, in their mindset, there's always hope for change. And not only that, if you are abused as a child as well, and you're not getting the love and care and compassion and the attention as a child, if you have a boyfriend who's giving you even an iota of that, that is magnified a thousand times because you have not received that as a child. So you're trying to fulfill a void, which is, getting love and compassion and attention um, through this individual who, who you're reliant on, who's supposed to be your protector, but is the complete opposite. But, but you know, keep, you know this, obviously, abusers are very charming. They're very manipulative. They will abuse you, but then in order to compensate that immediate compensation, they will flower you with love or gifts or, or attention or throw you a surprise party. There there are tactics to all of this. But the last straw for me, of course, was at 24 when I left India in 1999 of December was when I was just tired of, of, of the infidelity. It was repeated infidelity. It was, you know, the film industry, it's very easy. He's a big star. It's very easy to have girls, young, beautiful girls throwing themselves at you, um, which in, by no means is justifiable to what he did. Um, but, but the last straw was just, I saw no future at 24. I decided I'm done. I broke up with him. I moved to America. I finished my education. I had dropped out in ninth grade because I went after this guy who I didn't know over a teenage silly crush. Um, it was serendipitous to, to having had the opportunity to actually go to a country where I know no one and, and to meet him and to end up dating him is, is bizarre. It's a bizarre story in itself. Yeah. Um, but nonetheless, um, you know, there's a saying that you, you should never meet your idol because uh, many a time it's quite disappointing um, mm-hmm. or someone that you'll hero worship because you don't know who the real person, what they're really like. And initially the awe dissipated the first time I was abused. 
um, initially was like, oh my God, like I can't believe I'm dating him. This is actually happening. But the first time that I was slapped is when the awe completely dissipated. And then you learn who the real individual is and what their character is. I think innately, I always had this, this trait of wanting to help people. And um, now it's grown to such a huge, huge extent with this organization that has saved so many lives. And I deem it to be the most selfish thing that I can ever do because it is so therapeutic for me because in every woman, I see my mother. In every child, I see myself and my brother. So, uh, you know, it's it's been very, very therapeutic. So I, I deem it perhaps one of the best things I can do for myself. And I deem it to be the best reasons to wake up and get out of bed every morning. You You are saving lives literally every day. And the best part is that you're not taking a salary for it. You're doing it for free. You're giving 20 for, there, there are no days off for abuse, right? So I work Saturdays and Sundays. Whenever the call comes, I answer it. 100% um, of our funding goes to the victim services program. So I invested uh, wisely. I own four apartments and I live off of the rental income. And I did not want to do no more tears for a salary. Uh, nothing against people that take salaries. I will admit some of them are astronomical and preposterous. Some of these heads that are my job title, the salaries that they take, I'm just like baffled as to why you need such a large salary in the nonprofit field. Right. right. Um, but yeah, I'm proud of I'm proud of what was born. Uh, uh, something so horrible created something so good, and you have to look at it from an optimistic perspective. How were you able to get to that place? Um, being able to leave India at 24 and coming to the United States and going to school. Um, because, you know, we talked about how survivors, they don't have those financial means. They're tied to their abuser in some way. So how were you able to break free of that? Well, from India, first thing I did is I went to Pakistan to see my father I, after I broke up with him. From Pakistan, my, fa my father helped me fly back home to Florida. I came and stayed with my mom for a little while. I um, had a pity party and felt sorry for myself and then I realized that that's not going to get me anywhere. And my brother encouraged me to go to school. He said, Somi, you're, you have, you're young, you're 24, you have your whole life ahead of you. You need to finish your schooling. And, you know, unfortunately, I had savings from my work in India. And also my father helped me financially. He was there for me financially. Um, and, you know, from whatever I had, I invested it into properties. So that helped me. And then what- Because what, you were in the Bollywood industry yourself. Right. In, exactly. In so I did 10 films as a leading actor. And I worked with top, top actors. And I was doing that from the age of 16 to 23. By the age of 24, I was ready to get married and settle down. But then I realized that that would be the worst decision because if I were to get married, I would still be verbally and physically abused. And, and if I were to have children with this individual, then that would be a horrible, then we're repeating the cycle of what, what I grew up in, in my house as a child in Pakistan. So I did not want that cycle to be repeated. I would say the complete 180 uh, came from education. Had I not gone to college and had I not questioned, because as a young girl, I was not allowed to question things because in Pakistan, I, I, I remember my, I, my father, I asked him, why can't girls uh, go to the mosque and pray with men? And my dad said, girls don't ask questions. So I, that stuck in my head. And you know, those are some of the cultural norms that I'm talking to you about. Um, and now I, I did everything that I was told not to do. I went and worked in films. Um, I, you know, I was, I started out as a model at 16. Um, I dated a man that my father had warned me, which I should have listened to him that he's not gonna, this is not gonna be good for you. Uh, I never got married. I never had children. And um, I pretty much, I, I took the road less traveled and I, I did things my way, even when I was in India and when I was cheated on by this actor, I cheated on him too. I had my own affairs. I was like, oh yeah, if you're gonna do this, I'm from Florida. I'm not, I'm not gonna put up with it. If you're gonna do this and I'm gonna do it too. And now in my forties, I realized why I did that. I got that spark and that rebellious nature from my mother because my mom was very rebellious. And I also 
believe that if men can do it, why can't women do it? And another pivotal reason I did have those affairs was because I was looking for love. Um, it wasn't about the, the flings or the one night stands or the, or the, the sex, the sexual intimacy aspect of it. It was solely right. a child or teenage girl looking for love who, when she found the guy that she had gone to India to find, realized that it was completely, a, a, you know, disappointing. And I was disillusioned by, I was in love with a character. I was a little girl. And when I met the real person, he was antithetical to the character of what I saw. So whatever I did, I acted out and it was all because I was trying to still find love. And um, all of it makes sense now, of course, in hindsight. Right. And what was the switch for you when you realized, okay, this is now my path and my purpose and I wanna help other survivors? So what happened is after I finished school, um, I used to live in plantation seven years ago, as I mentioned to you. And there was a, a, a woman from Bangladesh that used to live in the neighborhood. And I used to have two dogs and I would walk my dogs in the evenings. And I would always notice her down. I noticed some bruises on her. And one day she, I was in the midst of thinking of starting a nonprofit and I wanted to help like women, children, men, I didn't know the mission. I just knew I wanted to start a charity. And she knocked on my door and she was injured on her forehead. And she said, my father-in-law has raped me. My husband has been abusing me for 10 years and I don't know what to do. So I said, please come in. Uh, you know, I wiped her, her blood from her forehead and I heard her entire story. And I told my brother and she and I ended up putting her in the medical assistance program. I paid for my savings. There was no, no more tears at that point in time. I called my brother and he said, the mission literally knocked on your door. There can't be a bigger sign than this because you were looking to, to start a charity and you were thinking you want to do something with women and children. And then later wow. on, at, you know, as yeah, it was so, it was, it was insane. It was literally like God sent the mission to my door yeah, uh, knocking and um, she's doing well now. This was 2006 because we registered no more tears in 2006 after I met with this lady and we were approved, approved by the IRS in 2007. So, um, so that was, yeah, the mission came to my door literally. And I was like, if there's one immigrant woman brought here and this is happening to her, there have to be several others. And then I started learning about honor killings and child marriages and rapes and child abuse. And, and then I, I learned about human trafficking. I didn't even know what human trafficking was at that time because human traffic, I started the mission with a focus on domestic violence. And human trafficking just is, is growing rapidly because it's even surpassing the drug industry because you can use drugs once, but you can use people again and again. And I, you know, I was, it stood out to me when you said your offices used to be in plantation or you were in plantation because I know plantation is like one of the most, you know, uh, hot spots for lack of a better word that I can think of right now for human trafficking. Like, oh yeah, it's a hub. It's a hub. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a hub for Lauderdale Plantation, even Miami, all of these places. It's happening everywhere. And then there's another aspect to this is the encrypted dark web where children are being sold or or you know, we uh, we have parents that are uh, having, you know, committing sexual acts on their young children uh, as people are paying them and this is all the dark web. The dark web is also another very dangerous place. It is incumbent upon us. It is our duty to take a stand against those that are screaming and they remain unheard. It is our duty to give back no matter who we are, even if we're blessed a little. And I'm not saying you don't have to pick no more tears, pick any cause, but you must give your, your, your part. You must do your part, whether it's climate change, whether it's cleaning the beach, whatever it may be, we have to do that. We all have to have a purpose and we must give back. What keeps you going? All the atrocities and all the injustices in the world. That is something that gets me out of bed every day. And I know that in my lifetime, human trafficking and domestic violence and sexual abuse of, of children will not be eradicated. But 
at least I know that when I am gone, that I was able to make a difference and, and save lives. At least I know that I didn't sit around and complain about it. I didn't sit around and, and say, well, what can I do? No, it takes, it takes a village. And fortunately, we've got such wonderful board of directors, such wonderful service providers, such wonderful volunteers. Our interns are young college students, which is very important. I want these 19, 20, 21 year olds to know what, what domestic violence is. I want them to know how they're lured on Instagram. All these traffickers are very manipulative, very sharp. They're luring these kids on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So when I get these kids from, from, from Nova or Barry or UM, um, you know, whichever, we're signed up with all the universities and all the schools, high schools, um, I teach them and they shadow me. Um, so, so, you know, that might, we all need a purpose. Without, without a purpose, what is life? And what better purpose than to help others and save their lives, literally. How can people support No More Tears USA? Well, there are many ways. Uh, I've been for the past four or five years trying to come up with a way to run this campaign where if 10,000 people sign up for $10 a month, uh, I have no marketing background, so I'm not able to, to do justice to this idea. But I, I always say we need the financial support. If you can't if you can't give a lot, sign up for five bucks, 10 bucks a month. That's not a lot. We spend that on coffee in a day. Uh, toiletries, that's a big need. Remember when we rescue the victims, all they have is the clothes on their backs. Uh, toys for the children, do a toy drive, do a toiletry drive. Um, post on your social media, follow at No More Tears USC on Instagram. Raise awareness about who we are. We are I think probably one of the, the rarest nonprofits where no one takes a salary and where the founder doesn't sit behind the desk and does hands-on field work. And I'm not saying this out of any, any conceit or pomposity. I'm just saying this because this is what I love to do. Um, so sign up 10 bucks a month, five bucks a month, toy drive, toiletry drive. We're always looking for, for gently used clothing um, shoes. There's so many ways to give back, but awareness, create awareness about no more tears would be the biggest help we can get because awareness leads to donations. Donation leads to saving more lives. Wow. I'll make sure to definitely link to all of that information below in the show notes so people can find more, um, about you and what you're doing and how they can help and support you as well. Is there anything else that you want people to know about No More Tears? Oh, well, I think that No More Tears is very unique and it's a family and we treat each survivor like a family member. They're not a case number for us. And um, we have baby showers for them. We have birthday parties for them on Saturdays. We have park days for our children. Um, you know, it, it's a very family oriented nonprofit. It's a very uniquely run nonprofit. And what's the, the best part of it is that there's immediate assistance. There's no waiting list. That's what I love about No More Tears. And um, a, as a survivor myself, it means the world to me. And um, I don't think one ever fully heals from, from these kind of atrocities, but um, if you care about this mission, if you care about human beings, if you care about victims of domestic violence or trafficking or children that are sexually and physically abused, I don't see any good person who would not care about these things. Please care and donate to No More Tears. That's what I would like to say. Thank you so much, Somi. It's really truly been a pleasure uh, meeting you and hearing your story and all of the amazing work that you're doing. It's so, so needed and so honorable and thank you. Thank you, thank you for your time. Thank you for giving me a platform to share my truth, thank you. Somi's energy and just her passion and drive and purpose to give back to other survivors is truly infectious. So make sure you find her information below in the show notes. Connect with her on Facebook, Twitter, 
Instagram, find them on their website. All of that information is easily accessible for you. And hey, make sure you connect with me as well because I want to stay connected with you. I want to know what you think about the show, the podcast, what you want to hear more of. So make sure you leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, connect with me on LinkedIn, send me a DM, and also hit subscribe on YouTube. Turn on those notifications because I know you want to be back here next week when we have a new episode. So until then, stay happy, stay healthy.